if you'll stand with us. You few and faithful, we're going to sing today. <laughs> We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. By his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your love and your grace. We ask God that you would guide and direct as we seek to worship today. Thank you, Father, for guiding and watching over us and Lord, we want to pray even today for the folks at Nogal Camp Meeting. I pray, God, today that as they conclude their services there, that there would be many that have come to faith in Christ and came to know Jesus as Savior and that they would have a deeper walk with Him. And pray, Father, for those who would be going to the Alto Retreat, God. Just pray, God, that you would just help them to have strength and, and learn Christ and, and come to faith in Christ as well. And, Pray, Father, that you would just make it a time of spiritual renewal and refreshment. And, Father, we pray for our services here and just ask God that you would just guide us in a very special way. Help us, Lord, to be closer to you and, and to live for you in all that we say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you say hi to folks around you? And uh, we've got a friend here named Randy that came all the way from Austin, Texas. Meet Randy Gonzalez, if you would, this morning. Reach across the way and say hi to him. Amen. Welcome him. Go ahead and be seated if you would, whenever you get a chance. And we want to welcome Mr. Shane Henry home. Yeah. Glad to have Mr. Shane home and the family. Thank you. You betcha. Fantastic. Are there um, any birthdays or anniversaries? Anybody want to have, celebrate a birthday or anniversary? Want to acknowledge that as well? All right. Peyton had a birthday. All right. And Heaven's blessings yes. on you. Working man bringing out Heaven's the cat. Heaven's blessings <laughs> on you. Good job. Heaven's Peyton. blessings. God bless you. Heaven's blessings job, on you. All right. Okay. Okay. Heaven's blessings. All right. And. I don't know who is scheduled for children's time, but we're just going to pass on that, I think, this morning, and we'll just keep moving right on. Um, he Knows My Name is the next song, so yeah, stand with us and us. let's sing. I have a maker. Time began my 
my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when that he does hear us when um, we call to him. And um, when I chose this song, Count Your Blessings, I had no idea Shane would be back. And so we can count a blessing that he's back singing with us in church again. Count your blessings. When upon life's pillows you are tempest-tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy? You are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God Name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Would y'all bow with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. We thank you for the moisture that you sent for, to help heal the country, Father God. We just uh, we ask that you bless this offering today, Lord, and bless it, and just bless bless each and every one that gives, Father God. We just we love you so much. And we ask that you bless the word today, and we just ask all this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. All I want, hell to build my life upon all the world reveres and wars to own. All I once held gain, never count at loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. When you, Jesus, knowing you. joy 
by my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and I love you Lord oh to know the power of your risen life and to know death my lord so with you to live and never die knowing you jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and i love you lord Let me invite you to open your Bible to the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter number 1. Although our service is generally sent out on YouTube and Facebook, and we're getting a, heck, a real feedback, a sound. That, can you trim that just a little bit, guys? It's generally sent out on Facebook and and YouTube, it's just going to be recorded today and then it'll be posted later as we've got our folks that usually do that are out for us this week and we just want to thank the Lord for, for those places. But I'm reminded really of two things as I began this service. In fact, as I was sitting there praying and thinking, I thought about there may be someone today for the first time that hears the gospel. There may be someone for the first time. Now you may have sat in church a hundred times, five hundred times, but you never heard the gospel penetrate your heart. But someone today may for the very first time. And then there may be someone today that hears the gospel for the very last time. There may not be another time. This may be your last Sunday. It may be my last Sunday. And when we think of the sincerity of what we're talking about today in those terms, it really is quite critical that we really focus on what the Word of God says. The little letter of Ephesians. It is a circular letter, chapter number one. I'll just give you a little background before we get into the text. It's a circular letter. We know that because there is no identification of any individuals in the letter. Unlike the book of Colossians that closes with the fourth chapter having a list of people's names or 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians or Romans having a list of people's names. There are no people named in the book of Ephesians. Unlike Paul's other letters, there is a very unusual introduction to the book of Ephesians. For example, take your Bible. You're, you're in Ephesians. Keep your finger there. We'll be back in a moment. Flip over to the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 3. 
It's interesting, in Paul's other letters, he always does something, but, but he doesn't do it in Ephesians, because this is not a letter to an individual church. It is a letter that is going to be circulated. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, think what he says. He begins this letter with a prayer. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Go to the very next letter, if you will. Go, you're in Ephesians, go to Colossians. Go to Colossians, turn over to chapter 1, verse 3, again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always. But you don't find that in Ephesians. In fact, Paul does not have a prayer listed here. He will list a prayer in a few moments, we'll see that. But Paul moves from the introduction of Ephesians chapter 1. Go back to Ephesians 1. Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus. We recognize the word Ephesus. We recognize in the oldest manuscripts that word does not appear, which means that letter was passed around. It made the mail route and probably concluded in Ephesus. But in our oldest manuscripts, that word just simply is not there. And then he talks about grace and peace. And then all of a sudden, Paul moves from that little greeting to an outburst of praise. Blessings do our God wherein lies our worth. In other words, as you and I praise God, we recognize our whole worth, our whole value is in God. God is our worth. I couldn't help but smile as we were singing the song a few moments ago. And, and Linda, it, it reminded me of your mother. Every time I go visit your mama at, at the beehive, she says, now we're supposed to count our blessings, but I just can't count that high. We're supposed to count our blessings, but I just can't count that high. And I hear that at least a dozen times in every visit, and I know you do as well. But aren't you glad that's what she's stuck with? That's the thought that's stuck in her mind. Wouldn't it be horrible to say, oh, I'm supposed to count my blessings and I can't think of a single one? But no, little Mrs. Upton, yep, we're supposed to count our blessings, but I just can't count that high. Count your many blessings. So let's look what we're talking about. We're blessing God. Look at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly in Christ. Now, now your Bible is going to say in heavenly places, but recognize that word places. Do you see it? Look in your Bible. That word is italicized. Do you see it? It's in italics. Which means it is not in the original Greek language. It's not in the text. But it's placed in there. But the word heavenlies is a very interesting little word. It is one of those words that is used five different times. And it's used only in Ephesians as Paul uses that word. And he's talking about a realm. He's talking about a, a spiritual realm. But blessed. Blessed be God. And then notice verse number 4, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love, He predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kindness and intention of His will, to the praise and the glory of His grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. We know that is Jesus. So these first few verses are a reminder to us about praising God. Now, let me just kind of break this down for you. Verse 3 through verse 14 is one sentence in the Greek language. It is 202 words, one long sentence. Interestingly enough, Ephesians is made up of 155 verses, but in this section, this one long sentence... It tells us, it reminds us that God is worthy of our praise, not only for who He is, but what He's done. Now notice, if you will, verse 6, to the praise of His glory. 
Notice verse 12, it ends, to the praise of his glory. Notice, if you will, verse 14, how it ends, to the praise of his glory. Do you see it? Over and over and over and over again, Paul is talking about praise to his glory. Now, now let me help you with something here that, that I hope is significant to you. Today, this passage will focus on praise. Paul is not focusing right now on prayer. He is focusing on praise. So there are three things I want you to think about and you praise God. First of all, I believe that praise is the ultimate reflection of our faith. Praise is the ultimate reflection of our faith. You remember what Job says, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The concept of praise should be the dynamic piece. Now, many people say, well, how do you know that you're a Christian? Well, I repented. Well, how do you know I'm a Christian? Well, I have faith. Well, how do I know I'm a Christian? Well, I obey. Let me tell you, if you really want to know you're a Christian, it determines what is coming out of your mouth in praise. Because if there is no praise, I have a hunch you don't really know God. Praise is the ultimate, ultimate reflection of our faith. Why? Because secondly, I want you to hear me, praise is a reflection of our heart. It is a reflection of what God is doing inside of us. It is a reflection of how we feel No, it is a reflection of what we know, which leads me to the third thing. Praise reveals how well we know God. You can praise somebody if you know them, but you can't praise people you don't know. And what Paul is going to do here is absolutely amazing because let me just give you a real little simple outline and take you in the next couple of weeks What you find in verses 3 through 14 is praise be to God. When you move to chapter 1 verse 15 through verse 23, then you find Paul praying for the saints, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but then you come to chapter 2 verses 1 through 10, and you have a picture of the redemption that God has given us in our hearts. So when you take this passage apart, it is moving us to praise. So let me explain it in this way. Praise is the language that permeates this text. Look at the word blessed. Let's let's just take it apart. Let's just take it apart piece by piece. In verse 3, he said, blessed, blessed, blessed. How many of you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus spoke the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. But there's a different word. In the Sermon on the Mount, the word blessed is the Greek word makarios. It means happy. But here, this word isn't happy. This is where we get the word eulogy from. Eul, logos. It, you, meaning good. Logos, meaning word. In fact, when, when you die, look at the person next to you, smile, say, yours is coming. One day all of us are going to be there. When, when you die, somebody's going to give a good word about you. It's called a eulogy. You know, you don't want your funeral and folks gather together and say, now that dirty rat that's in that box, that's, that's not really what you want at your funeral. You, you want folks to give a good word about you. I heard about the preacher that was doing a funeral one time, and, and this guy had been an absolute scoundrel, and the preacher just got up and started waxing about what an upstanding character was, and what a fine guy, and, and what a great father and loving husband, and, and pretty soon the mama poked her son and said, you get up there and be sure that's your daddy in that box. We must be in the wrong funeral. You see, see, the fact is, when we have a funeral, we use the word eulogy, and that is really the, where the word comes from right here. It is you logos. It is a good word, a good word, but notice, it is a good word be to 
God. You see, God is due a good word about who he is. Do you, do you catch what I'm saying? God is saying, speak a good word about me. Yeah, I don't know about you, but all of us like to have some praise of affirmation in life. Ladies, if you've worked hard to prepare a meal, don't you like to at least know that it was good? Thank you for dinner. Yeah. Yeah, I worked for a guy many, many, many years ago, and in fact, I was very young, and, and I used to get tickled. He said, well, we're going to the house, and if the food's ready, I'm not going to eat it, and if it's not, I'm going to raise cane. And I thought, if I were married to you, I'd hit you with a skillet. I mean, I'd meet you at the door, but that's the way he operated. I, I used to get so tickled. I, well, it wasn't tickled. I felt sorry for his wife, because she wonder, made a wonderful lunch. We'd come in from the field. It's a marvelous lunch, but oh, I'm not going to eat it if it... And I'd just think, oh, but blessed, blessed be God and, and the Father of our Lord Jesus. Now, now, let me help you. This sentence is one sentence, but the sentence is made up in three sections. So go to the very next slide, guys. It's made up of three different sections. In verse 3 through 6, it's talking about praise be to God. We are chosen by God, the Father. And then in verse 7 through 10, it says, praise God because he has redeemed us by his son. We have salvation because of what Jesus has done for us. Praise be to God because Jesus has done this for us. And then ultimately, praise be to God because he has sealed us. He has approved us with his Holy Spirit who lives within us. It's an amazing, amazing peace. See... When we think about praise, really there is a language of praise. Now, I don't want to ever be judgmental, but, but you know, I'm a little bit cautious of people who are, everything is praise, 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 praise. Are you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I have a dear pastor friend who was a mentor years ago, and his name is Dr. Dean Mathis, and uh, one of the best friends I've ever had in my life, and, and Dean... Dean used to say, you got to watch out for those spiritual pastors because they're the ones that will try to run off with the piano player. No, no, no offense. But, but that, that's what Dean used to say. And he'd say, you better watch out for those spiritual guys because everything is just candy-coated praise, praise. And I'll just be honest, it's hard for me to believe that life is like that. You know, life has good and life has bad. Yeah, I don't think God wants you to jump out of your pickup when you have a flat and say, Oh, thank the Lord Jesus, I've got a flat right here. Oh, let me just celebrate and have a holy dance. But I know people who pretend to believe like that. Yeah, I, I, I believe in an emotion in your faith. But I do not believe in an emotional faith. Does that make sense? I believe you should have emotion in your faith, but I do not believe in an emotional faith. Folks, emotion should not be the only thing that is driving your faith. But what Paul does for us is he gives us a logical reason to praise God because we have been chosen by God the Father. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. All the reasons for our praise and, and the word, notice if you will, we are blessed, we are to bless God. That's what he's saying. Blessed be God. Give God a good word. High five God. We've got a little kid that came to Bible Buddies the other night and I got tickled. We, we had two little bitty ones, two little bitty ones. And they, they would, we were playing musical chairs, musical chairs. And you'd have to run around and then, and by the way, next week we're going to teach them how to do the Ten Commandments. Y'all know the Ten Commandments? Anybody in here want to recite all Ten Commandments? Anybody got a shot at it? The little kids are doing it on Bible buddies, I'll promise you. But it's kind of funny because when they're playing their little musical chairs, this one little girl was nailing it. And Scott McMath, every time she'd nail it, he'd run up and he'd do that. And she'd oh, give him that high five. And that's what, exactly what God's saying to us here. You know, once in a while, we need to say, high five God. 
You have done so much for us. Why? Notice what he says. Because you have blessed us. You have spoken a good word about us where? Notice in the heavenlies. Do you see it? This is the word heavenlies. It is used by Paul, as I said, only in Ephesians. It's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. And it's talking about a spiritual realm. Listen, there is a battle. There is a war. There is a spiritual world happening all around us that we cannot see. You know what the word Satan means? The accuser of the brethren. Remember the book of Job? And Satan came to accuse Job? He is the accuser? Well, let me tell you what God does in turn is God speaks a good word that overpowers a negative accusation. That's God for you. He has blessed us. He has blessed us. That's what makes the book of the Revelation so powerful. The accuser of the brethren. The accuser that accuses us in life. His life will be over. But God's blessing for us. It's a present tense indicative. It's, it continues on in life. And then notice if you will. How has he done it? He's done it in Christ. And then look at verse 4. Just as he's chosen us. He's chosen us. Now all of a sudden people say uh oh. Remember what I told you last week, this, this book was John Calvin's favorite book. And there's a very obvious reason, because it speaks highly of predestination. And I just want to tell you, is predestination in the Bible? Yes. Is free will in the Bible? Yes. Is there a tension in those two things? Yes. And do we trust God with it? Yes. You cannot spend your life trying to get on either far end of that realm or you'll end up in a theological ditch. You see, if it's all about free will, then I save myself. If it's all about God predestined and I have no choice, then I have no choice. But somehow God in His sovereignty brings them together. I love what was said one time when Spurgeon was asked, how do you reconcile God's choosing and man, or God's election, and man's freedom. How do you reconcile that, Spurgeon? And Spurgeon said, you don't have to reconcile friends. Let me tell you, from heaven's perspective, God chose you. And from earth's perspective, we responded to His grace and received Jesus. They're both, they're both, what makes up the coin of salvation? It's two telephone poles, folks, that holds up the wire of salvation. God chose us. I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. But God gives us free will to respond. You take both of those and the wire stays up. He chose us before the foundation of the world, before any of this ever started. God knew in His foreknowledge. He knew but I want you to see what he's chosen us to do. Look, if you will, don't stop. Read the whole text. Understand the whole concept. He chose us to be what? Holy and what? Blameless. So what did God predestine us to be? Well, let me help you here. Take your Bible. Turn back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. What did God choose us to be? Romans 8, 29. For God, verse 29, Romans 8, for whom he foreknew, he did predestine to be what? What did he destine us to be? To be conformed. Do you see it? To be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you see what? We have been destined to be what? To be formed to the image of His Son. That is what He has predestined us to be. Let me, let me, just, uh, let me just help you with the word. The word predestined really is the word pro-horizo. Pro-horizo. That's, that's the Greek word. It's a compound word. Pro, before, or 
above. Or, and, and then the idea of horizon, the horizon. In other words, it's God marked out the boundaries in your life and my life so we might become like Jesus. Let me help you. I, I want you to look at Galatians 4 with me for a minute. Turn to the book before, before Ephesians, Galatians 4. Galatians 4, 19. I, I don't know how to say this except just say it. But I feel Paul's pain in Galatians 4.19. In Galatians 4.19, Paul says to these folks, My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Do you see that, Galatians 4.19? Is that what your Bible says? So what is that saying? It's saying the heart of every pastor is that Christ be formed in the hearts of the people. And I'll just be honest with you. There's times I wonder if that's even happening. I just wonder. Because everything in the world becomes our priority. Everything. And what Paul is praying is that Christ would be formed in the hearts of his people. I tell you, the American church is in a mess today. Because Christ is not the priority in the hearts of most American churches. It pains me. But notice back to Ephesians he predestined us notice <laughs> once again he chose us in verse 4 he predestines us in verse 5 he predestines us to adoption now, I don't know about you but adoption is kind of a cool thing have you ever been around someone that was so blessed to know that they were chosen you know, I, I know I came into this world because of a moonlight romance in San Bernardino, California. That's how I got here. I got the wedding deals over at the courthouse. I remember looking at it one day and thought, man, that was I premature. Whew. But I want to tell you, a Roman adoption was a big deal. You see, if you had a child in Rome, and you're a Roman citizen, if you're a Roman father, and your son messed up, you could put that son to death. But if you adopted a child, and you were a Roman father, you could never disinherit that son. Regardless of what happened, he could not be disinherited. That was Roman law. So the idea of adopting a child in Roman law was a significant thing. And Paul says it this way. God not only chose you, but he has adopted you. He will never be able to disinherit you. In fact, he's going to prove it at the end of this passage when he gets to the Holy Spirit. And then, I, I, you know the words, he, he's predestined us, a, the adoption of sons through Jesus, 
to himself according to Christ or according to the kind intention of his will. I love that, according. See, God has a plan. It's God's plan, according. God's working to the praise of his glory and grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He, he uses the word in so often. The, the, Paul, Paul presents the gospel in prepositions. Paul says we are in Christ. We, we're literally put into him. And then there's times Paul says, and Christ is in you. And then there's times Paul says, and you can do things because Christ works through you. It is a picture of preposition after preposition after preposition. It is Christ working through prepositions in our lives. And then he moves to now not only talking about what the Father's done. Look at verse 6, the way it closes. He calls Jesus the beloved, and then in verse 7 through verse 10, he begins to talk about the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to the kind intention which he purposed in him with a view of the administration suitable for the fullness of time, that in the summing up of all things in Christ, once again, things were in the heavenlies and things upon the earth in Him. That little word in Him used 22 times, in Him, in Him, in Him. But what does it talk about? What is redemption anyway? It means to buy something back. It literally means to buy back an item. I shared this story with you. I, when I was a little kid, my mama, my mama would always shop at stores that gave S and H green stamps. Dave, did you ever give stamps? Some years ago, yeah, everybody gave stamps. My mama was a green stamp shopper, and, and my job, she'd get a big old books of stamps, and my job was to lick them and stick them and lick them and stick them. And, and I mean, I did, you, when you got a bunch of stamps, how many of you licked and stuck stamps? Raise your hand. Rest of you young people have not a clue. You don't know what life really is about. Licking stamps meant that when you got enough of them, it was, oh, we get to go shopping. And I would go with my mom to the s and Green Stamp Redemption Center. That's what they called it, the Redemption Center. And we would go in there with our books of stamps and we would look and mom would be looking at the things that she thought she needed. And I would be looking over here at the footballs and the ball gloves, the things I knew we needed. She was focusing on her wants. I was focusing on my needs. And we would buy that stuff with those stuff. It was better than cash, better than cash. But what is redemption? Well, take your Bible and turn over with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 for a minute. 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to look at verse 17. What exactly is this redemption business all about? Because in Ephesians, he will talk about redemption in verse 7. He's going to close with the concept in the view of redemption in verse 14. But, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in the fear during your time of your stay on earth. In other words... There ought to be some reverence in your life as you live. And then notice why. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from a futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. But how were you redeemed? You were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ. 
Do, do you see how potent this picture is? It means to buy back one's own possession. It's a powerful, powerful word. You are in Christ. You are getting back. We are redeemed. God made us and God bought us back. When I first started pastoring, Jim Green was one of my pastor mentors and he gave me a little book. The book I read until the pages fell off and I couldn't stick it together anymore and ultimately I threw it away. But it told the story of a little boy and it talked about the act of redemption. And a little boy one day wanted to craft something special and he worked with his hands in his father's wood shop like Tyson. He was a good woodworker and he started making this little boat and he carved this little boat and he whittled on it and he sanded on it and he built out the bow and the hull and, and he made some, took some little dowel rods and drilled out and made a little sail and, and he made a gorgeous little boat and, and he took that little boat and, and he had it tethered to a string and he would take it out to a massive lake pond there by, by his house and he would let that little boat set on that water and it would go out to sea so to speak, and he would then pull it back in. Before the boat got too far, he would pull it back in. And one day as he pulled, a gust of wind came, and that string broke. And the little boy sat and watched his boat go out till it was out of sight. And a few months later, the little boy was in town and he walked by a second-hand store, and he saw there in the window his boat. He knew he had made that boat. That was his boat. He had painted it. He had made the sail. That was his boat. And he ran in, and he said, Mr., where did you get my boat? And the man said, no, 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 no. That's my boat. I paid for that boat, and the only way you'll get this boat back is to buy it. The little boy said, well, what'll it take? The guy gave him a price, and the little boy knew it was above what he had, but he went home and busted his bank, and he gathered Coke bottles. He did everything he possibly could and rounded up enough money and went back, and he threw it on the counter. And he picked up that little boat and he hugged it close to his heart and he said, now you're really mine. I made you with my own hands. I sailed you. And now I have bought you back. Folks, that is a picture of redemption. God made us and he has bought us back. And let me close in this way. How's it all work? Well, notice verse 11 through 14. He then talks about the Holy Spirit. He has given us in verse 14 a pledge of our inheritance. The redemption of God's own possession to His praise. He's given us the earnest of our inheritance, the pledge. Have you noticed something in this text? Although you've never heard the word, did you see the Trinity? God the Father, verses 3 through 6. God the Son, verses 7 through 10. And God the Holy Spirit, verses 11 through 14. He gave an inheritance. Nick sells real estate. He knows more about this than I do, but I know any time I've ever bought a piece of real estate, Nick, I had to put down earnest money, which meant I was serious about the deal. I had different times or different amounts of earnest money, probably depending on the value of the land. I don't know if there's a rule of thumb how that figures. I don't know. I'm glad it's never been much because I couldn't have ever bought it, but, but the truth is, 
Every time I've ever bought something, I had to put money on the table. You know what God says in his word? Is God chose you. He's adopted you. And he's made payment for you by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's put the Holy Spirit down as earnest money to guarantee that he will seal the deal. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for allowing us to just look into your word today. What a powerful, powerful statement of who we are. God, we have worth because of Jesus. We have value because of him. And God is due a good blessing. He's due a good word. Hallelujah, God. God, you rock. Because you've done all of that for us. And Lord, I don't know who in the world will come upon this recording next week, next month, next year, someday. For the very first time, they will have heard the gospel. And I don't know who it would be, God, that would hear it for the very last time. But I know this, God, you make a provision for both to happen because it works according to your plan. For it's in Jesus' name. So we bow together for just a moment. I want to ask you this. Before we sing this song, I want you to really think about the words that we're going to sing together in a minute. I'd rather have Jesus. You know, Paul was grieved that the Galatian church just never moved on to maturity. God, help us to really, really ask ourselves, is Christ a priority for us? rather have Jesus. If you're here without the Lord, I'd love to share with you how you can receive him right now. It's as easy as acknowledging your sin, calling upon him to be your savior, putting your faith and your trust in him. If you feel the need to come, I'll promise you it is God calling you. He has chosen you. Whether you're watching online or here alive. As we stand together, won't you come? Come on. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. men's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus 
than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. Inside the bulletin, uh, you saw a little deal like this that talks about the master's voice. Uh, they'll be here in concert on Sunday night, August the 6th. So there will be no Sunday night prayer meeting that night. We're going to have a concert here in this, in this room. And these guys are coming, so you'll want to come and be a part of that um, August the 6th. Invite friends. Take it around the community. Uh, You'll enjoy these guys. These are just good old Southern gospel singers, and uh, they'll be coming through on a big bus, and um, maybe I'll audition, and maybe they'll let me go with them, and that, that'll, that'll work. You don't think that'll happen? Okay. I didn't think it would either, but, but I'd like to try it, because they all look handsome in that picture, so, so make, that, make that a, a priority. And then we're going to ask one other thing. Uh, we're going to be having the Bible Buddies this coming Wednesday night. It'll be our last one for the summer, and it'll be a water balloon Wednesday. We'll have a lot of fun with water balloons, and, and it's a good thing. Um, that it'll be. Kendra, can I pick on you for a second? No. no? <laughs> Come up here, kid. I appreciate this gal. I gave her a task. I said, Kendra, I need you to memorize the Ten Commandments in a special way. Uh, are you sweating? I'll help you. Okay. We'll do it together. Okay? Because okay. I said, we got to help these little kids. Do you realize how many little kids don't know the Ten Commandments? And sadly, there's people, if you don't know the Ten Commandments, don't raise your hand. Just say, oh, Jesus, I'm glad he didn't call me. <laughs> All right? Because what we've been able to do, we've been saying, okay, commandment number seven, and those kids are having to spit it back out. Okay, so Kendra and I have been working, and we found the, the coolest thing, how to memorize them. And I sent it to her and said, you, you be the teacher of this. So we start out with our fingers, right? Okay, so one is the first commandment is uh, one God. Is it nervous? Are you nervous? I am nervous. Okay. <laughs> one God, thou have yeah, I am the Lord thy God. Uh, there's one God. And then, two, okay, do not make for yourselves graven images and bow down. See it? Bow down. And then three, looks like a... W. W, yes. So we watch our Word. words... So do not take the name yes, she knows of the Lord God in vain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. And four is like a stop. Yes. Yeah. Stop and rest. Stop and rest. Honor the yes. Sabbath day and keep it holy. And number five is like salute father, father and mother yes sir honor your father and mother yes sir and six thou shalt not murder yes thou shalt not murder okay and seven God made us for it's two, not five. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It is two, not five. I got tickled the other night. Seely 
said to her mama, what's adultery? And Elaine looked at me, okay, answer it. <laughs> and I said, Seely, adultery is running off with some other man's wife. She said, I got it. <laughs> it was so funny. Okay, number eight is their favorite. Thou shall not steal, because if you steal, you go to jail. <laughs> and number nine. Four is not five, do not lie. Do not lie, do not bear false witness. Four is not five. And then number 10. Thou shalt not covet. Okay, y'all's turn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep, that's worked out really good. Then we'll be having the back to school picnic and notice the times. We won't be having a Sunday evening prayer meeting that night, but we are having the community wide picnic that evening. Yes, and baptism next Sunday. I'm going to get to that also. Thank you, sweetie. Um, yeah, so back to school picnic, community wide. And we've been in contact with the folks at the school. I don't know if you realize it, but there's, when you get to school, they run out of things called Kleenex quickly, hand sanitizers and stuff like that. So in your newsletter, there's going to be a list of some supplies. If you'd like to help us gather up some of those, we're going to have a little blessing box. And we actually have a blessing box deliverer. Uh, and so that will help as well. Uh, we do have a new teacher in the, that's coming to the school is looking for a place to rent. So if you know of a house for rent, uh, I talked with her this last week. She's coming from Los Lunas. Uh, and she's been friends with Ann Ford. Some of you remember Ann Ford. Uh, but anyway, she's looking for a house. I have no clue what grade she's teaching, but she's needing a house to rent. And next Sunday morning, uh, we're going to be baptizing Carson. So we'll be doing that in the service. Okay? All righty. Let's I sing. Can I have one, one quick announcement? Yeah. Um, I, I just um, went to the... Baptist Convention board meeting on um, Monday, and um, they, Civil's Camp, Civil's Baptist Camp, which is down at Cloudcroft, has finished up the camping season, but praise the Lord, they have a lot of weekends where they'll be having groups come in for retreats, and they could really use some volunteers. So if you'd like to go and work, it'll be all kinds of things. It could be cleaning, it could be um, helping cook. It could be a lot of different things, but they could really use some volunteers. So if you're interested, get in touch with me and I'll give you the name and the number of um, Jay Hammond, who is the yeah. camp manager. Yeah. So if you think, pray about it because they really could use some help. Amen. A good guy and he's been here. Don't forget uh, Heart to Heart Widows Ministry, uh, doing lunch on the second. It's in the bulletin. And then uh, youth will go bowling here in a little bit. I'm going to put it on you too. Thou shalt not beat thy pastor. God bless you. Have a great week. Sing with us as we go. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify hey. the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. For Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him.